In today's video, we're going to talk about in-service inspection and testing of electrical equipment, or PAT testing, as most people know it by. Hi, and welcome to this video on portable appliance testing, as it was known as. Um, We've just come out of a couple of schools and talking to site managers and facilities staff. Uh, and one of the things that's come out of it is that there's um, quite a lot of uncertainty around um, what was traditionally known as PAT testing. Um, now, PAT testing, um, portable appliance testing, was always deemed to be uh, checking anything that had a plug on it uh, for electrical safety uh, and that it had to be done every 12 months. Uh, now, that's never actually been the case. Um, but there is a new fifth edition of the in-service inspection and testing of electrical equipment, uh, which is essentially what everyone knew as the PAT testing regulations. Uh, now, in this fifth edition, interestingly, I've actually taken out of it the reference of portable and appliance. Um, so two things I just really want to cover um, is this whole thing about portable appliance and what you actually need to test. And the other thing I'd like to just cover is the frequency of testing. So if we look at frequency of testing first, then traditionally everybody seems to think that everything by law has to be tested every 12 months. Now, the first thing is that it's not actually law that you do PAT testing or in-service inspection of electrical equipment. Um, we're basically, we're looking under the electricity at work regulations, which say that we've got to make sure that the equipment that we're using is safe for use. And one of the most common ways that that's been adopted and put into practice is through the in-service inspection of electrical equipment or the PAT testing regulations as people used to know it. So it's kind of deemed that that's industry best practice, that if you follow that guidance, then you're doing uh, pretty much what you should be doing. Um, within that, everybody seems to think that everything needed testing every 12 months. Uh, what it actually says is that it's based on a risk-based approach. So what you need to do is have a competent person assess each piece of equipment and decide what the sensible retest period for that is. We are also going to look at uh, visual inspection uh, and formal inspection and test. So visual inspection should be done on a regular basis by the users of the equipment. So that might just be picking up an extension lead and just having a look at it, having a look at the plug and making sure it's not damaged um, and therefore it's not going to cause you uh, a problem in use. And then we have the actual physical testing of the equipment, which is normally done by somebody um, who has sufficient competence to be able to decide whether that piece of equipment is safe for continued use or not. Now, in terms of the periods of when you do that, as I say, it's on a risk-based approach determined by a competent person. So we might look at something that's really, really high risk. So a hoover, for instance, where the extension cable or the cable that's feeding the hoover is constantly getting run over, trapped in doors uh, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's likely to become damaged. So therefore, we might say, well, our risk says that that's quite, uh, that's quite likely to get damaged. So we're going to inspect that every three months, which is fine. The other things then, something like a computer which sits on a desk and is never moved or is very, very rarely used, it's unlikely to get damaged. You might decide that actually you're going to visually inspect that every six months, every 12 months, but your formal inspection where you physically unplug it and put it into the, the testing machine and you carry out all of the tests as determined by the, uh, the code of practice, you might decide that that could be every three years, for instance. So when you start to look at that, then actually this whole thing of testing everything every 12 months is a bit of a nonsense and it's never really been the case. It's just what people have said and thought. The second thing that I just want to touch on is the reason why in this fifth edition they've taken out the words uh, portable and appliance. Uh, essentially, the uh, people used to think that if it had got a plug on, then it came under these regulations and you needed to test it. Uh, what's happened is that the IET, Institute of Engineering and Technology, and the IEE, who write all this guidance, have, uh, have looked at it and said, the electricians, when they're doing their testing, their fixed wiring testing, are testing up to, for example, a, a fuse connection unit on a wall. But if you've got a hand dryer that's connected to that fixed wiring, 
then they're not testing that. So they're testing up to the point where the hand dryer is connected to, but anything after that point wasn't being tested. The pat testers then came in and said, well, that's not a portable appliance because it's screwed to the wall. So they weren't testing it either. So what's happened is that there's a huge amount of equipment that's kind of gone untested because it's attached to a wall or it's not deemed to be portable. So the code of practice, the fifth edition, essentially says that you need to work out what needs testing and how you're going to test that. So back to the hand dryers, that needs to be electrically tested. So it's now up to the competent person how you're going to do that. So onto the competent side of things, obviously somebody who's competent to be able to take a, a hoover and plug it into a pat testing machine or a, a test machine, let's just call it a pat test machine for, for clarity, for ease at the moment, but somebody who's competent to do that and test that specific piece of equipment could well not be competent to test your hand dryer. When you think about the different risks, if I'm going to test a hand dryer or something that's wired in to a system, then I need to be able to carry out safe isolation to be able to then unwire or connect into this appliance by removing the front of the fuse spur or whatever's feeding that piece of equipment. So I need to be able to make sure that I've done my safe isolation to make sure I'm safe and that I'm not going to get an electric shock. I then need to be able to understand how to connect that piece of equipment to my test equipment. And then I need to understand the tests that are actually relevant to that piece of equipment. So suddenly it's a whole different kind of um, test and competence that's required to be able to do that. A lot of people will be competent to do both. Um, but all I'm sort of trying to get across is that you do need to need to have a think about the competence of the contractors or of your site staff or whoever's carrying out your testing just to make sure that you have actually assessed that they're competent to carry out and do the work that you're asking them to do safely but also you know in a controlled manner understanding exactly what it is that's required and and not obviously safety is one of the the main priorities there so as I say, that's just a couple of things that I wanted to cover uh, around PAP testing. And it's interesting, we've been to three site visits today, which is where the idea for this video came in, uh, because this is obviously a real area that people don't understand, they don't grasp, and they, they kind of, they don't understand what comes under what regulations and why it might come under that. So again, it's all about trying to make sure that everything's safe for use. Hopefully this has been uh, interesting and informative. Um, if it's uh, useful, please like the video, share the video, and we'll uh, talk to you soon.